let's dive in. This is the conclusion to Gatsby. Um, I will, however, make a separate video that concludes the entire novel and goes through a whole summary main ideas. Look forward for that. We're just gonna right now go through the bulk of chapter nine. How does this story come to a close, really? I mean, all the action is done. From meeting Gatsby, the three month span to Gatsby's death. Chapter nine, we finally get Nick's narrative voice in its fullest and you know arguably some of the best writing of the 20th century he begins chapter nine after two years i remember the rest of that day and this is what i let you know early on that this is written of course from the perspective of nick carraway as our first person narrator everything that we know about gatsby in this story is filtered through nick and he doesn't tell the story chronologically he doesn't tell the story as the action happens we have these big narrative breaks like chapter six, where he dives into the past. When the conversation, the, where he learns the information of chapter six, that this doesn't happen until chapter eight. So it can get kind of messy there, but this is a simple story, really. Um, the story of Gatsby is simple. He was a poor boy from the Midwest, grew up as a farmer, went to the war, came back to try to win the love of his life, but really he just wanted wealth, and his corruption ended up in death. Along the way, you have Nick, moves to West Egg from the Midwest, tries to make money, meets Gatsby, has this three month crazy adventure and comes to a close. So the plot itself is very simple, but the way the story is told is really what gives so much meaning to this story and uh, gives shape to Nick as a character. So here we hear after two years, I remember the rest of that day. This is our clue that this story is written by Nick two years after the events have happened. Nick is so wounded by these events and, and it takes him two years to really, one, get all the information, but two, to process it in a coherent way. So again, when we talk about Nick's narrative voice, we're not just talking about a story that is told from beginning to end. This is the fruit of, of course, fictionally speaking, this is the fruit of a very mature, a very contemplative um, meditation and reflection on these events. What does that do for the veracity of the story, the truth? Do we rely on Nick? And I think ultimately we can say yes. We can say yes that Nick is a reliable narrator because he's not telling us stuff that he can really make up. He's telling us events that have happened. Myrtle's death, Gatsby's death, the affair, all these things that happened. The what happens is not as important as the why it happened. We're not questioning the events that happened in the novel. We're understanding them as Nick understands them. And this is what chapter nine tops it all off with. So after two years, what happens? Well, he talks about the commotion that Gatsby's death caused, how policemen, photographers, everybody stormed Gatsby's house because this was a murder in cold blood, a murder and an unfortunate tragic suicide. We want to know the story. And so really the whole story is, is explaining what happened to Gatsby. So let's move on. Um, again, takes Nick two years to remember the events of Gatsby's death. And what do we see? We see his house flooded with people. Now this is a direct uh, parallel or a juxtaposition to the parties that Gatsby's been having, right? People show up by the carloads to go into Gatsby's party, but they don't care about Gatsby. They don't know him as a person. They're surrounded by the mystery and the, the rumors that spread about Gatsby. People want to know about Gatsby, but they don't really care to know Gatsby. Same thing here at the end of his life. Photographers, reporters flood the gates of Gatsby's house. They don't care about him though. They just want to know what happened. They want the story. That's not what we get though. We get Nick's interpretation of it. And so we see that Nick is actually the only one who cares for Gatsby. Other than Nick, at this point, Gatsby's left entirely alone. Turn with me to page 164. This is Gatsby or Nick talking about um, how he really takes the role of being the one who makes the decisions and plans the funeral for Gatsby. So. 164, the first full paragraph. He begins by talking about all the reporters and the commotion. He says, but all of this is all this part of it seemed remote and unessential. 
I found myself on Gatsby's side and alone. Remember, Nick wants to believe in Gatsby, even if he's the only one. From the moment I telephoned news of the catastrophe to West Egg Village, every surmise about him and every practical question was referred to me. At first, I was surprised and confused. Then, as he lay in his house and didn't move or breathe or speak, hour upon hour, it grew upon me that I was responsible because no one else was interested. Interested, I mean, with that intense personal interest to which everyone has some vague right at the end. What is he talking about here? More snow melting. Uh, <laughs> he's talking about how, again, this idea that everyone wants to know about Gatsby, but not very many people, in fact, no one at this point, cares about Gatsby, truly actually has a human connection with Gatsby. And that last line, that intense personal interest to which everyone has some vague right at the end. He's talking about Gatsby. And it's a very human response here that at the time of one's death that per one per a person would want to know that people care that people were interested in his or her life and Gatsby is denied even that he is alone in death save Nick and this really is a cause for deep reflection on Nick Carraway right a reflection on death these people lived as if they were never going to die that death was never an option but the reality sets in. And so the symbolism here is that with Daisy, the illusion of Daisy being shattered, Gatsby's, all his pursuit is shattered, right? If you've ever read the book of Ecclesiastes, it talks about how everything is vanity and what's the point of building riches when they're just gonna be left to crumble. And so there's a really intense uh, reflection here. I won't go too far with that. Unless you wanna have a conversation about it, I'm always happy to talk more deeply about these things. The point is, he's alone. Gatsby is alone. Nick thought even Tom and Daisy, or at least Daisy, would call and send flowers. What did they do? They packed up and left. He called them, no answer. They don't even want to be part of this. They don't acknowledge any of this happening. They escape, and Nick's going to give some interesting commentary on that. Wolfsheim. He was introduced, Nick was introduced to Wolfsheim as one of Gatsby's closest friends. Not even Wolfsheim wants to come. No one comes except for Nick. So with Wolfsheim, he turns out to be a pretty important character in Gatsby's life. And in this chapter, we, Nick spends a lot of time discussing it. Because Meyer Wolfsheim truly was one of Gatsby's closest friends, if not the closest person to Gatsby, and even Wolfsheim doesn't attend the funeral. So how do we read this? Well, Wolfsheim actually gives us a lot more information um, about Gatsby's life. So real quick. Turn to page 165. We're going to look at a section in that bottom paragraph about seven lines up. Nick sends a request to Wolfsheim asking him to come to the funeral. And Nick says, I was sure he'd start, start when he saw the newspapers, just as I was sure there'd be a wire from Daisy before noon. But neither a wire nor Mr. Wolfsheim arrived. No one arrived except more police and photographers and newspaper men. If we turn to page 166, we see Wolfsheim's response to Nick's request that he come to the funeral. So let's go ahead and read that, top of 166. Dear Mr. Carraway, this has been one of the most terrible shocks of my life to me. I hardly can believe it that it is true at all. Again, this, still this notion of denying truth or reality. Such a mad act as that man did should make us all think. I cannot come down as I am tied up in some very important business and cannot get mixed up in this thing right now. Mixed up in this thing? Mixed up in a funeral? Well, this is an indication of the shady, underhanded lifestyle Gatsby really led. Um, that it's too dangerous for Wolfsheim to show that he was associated with Gatsby, which just really helps establish the fact that Gatsby was in some unsavory illegal business, and almost even a dangerous man. Continuing, if there is anything I can do a little later, let me know in a letter by Edgar, or butler, kind of servant guy. I hardly know where I am when I hear about a thing like this and am completely knocked down and out. The question I want to ask about Wolfsheim's response is, how sincere do you think this is? And I think there's a lot of conflicting things here. I think uh, in one sense there's definitely um, 
There's definitely a sincerity there, especially with the PS that's added at the end of the letter. He says, let me know about the funeral, etc. Do not know his family at all. Really emphasizing the loneliness here. So we see that Wolfsheim and Gatsby, it seems that they did have a close relationship. But it's kind of shadowed by all of this business that has to take place first, right? So the point of this is that everyone Gatsby was associated with, and to an extent, a large extent, Gatsby himself, they are all selfish people. The desire to please oneself and look out for oneself is far greater than anyone's capacity to look out for somebody else, except Nick. Nick is the only one that's different. He's grounded a little bit more in reality, and we'll talk more about that in this chapter. Uh, turn to page 172, though, because Wolfstein still has some very interesting comments regarding his relationship with Gatsby. On page 172, um, what happens here, Nick actually goes to see Wolfstein. He goes to his office because Nick is just demanding that somebody else come to his funeral. He wants to know that Gatsby didn't die in vain and he didn't die alone, but of course he did. So he finds Wolfsheim, and this is what he says. Let us learn to show our friendship for a man, when he is alive and not after he is dead, he suggested. After that, my own rule is to let everything alone. Now, on the surface, we can say that there's some good advice here, right? Don't wait till it's too late to be friends, to show your friendship, to show your affection or love in a very general way for somebody. Do it while they're alive. But at the same time, I can't help hearing a very selfish overtone to this. After that, my own rule is to let everything alone. It's over. He's dead. It doesn't concern me. He's not going to know if I went to the fun funeral or not. What does it matter? This selfish society that they're a part of. What do we expect from one of the most infamous gangsters and gamblers who fixed the World Series? This is just emphasizing the society and the lifestyle Gatsby was a part of. He was a part of this superficial, materialistic, selfish society. But we learn a little bit more about the relationship between Wolfsheim and Gatsby. We learn that Wolfsheim found Gatsby when he came back from the war. And what was the state of Gatsby? He was penniless. He was hungry. He couldn't even afford clothes. He wore his officer's uniform every day because he couldn't afford something else. And Wolfsheim, he says, I made Gatsby. Right. Wolfsheim is the man responsible for making Gatsby what he is, to an extent. When Gatsby comes back, Wolfsheim almost takes him in. And lest we think that this is some paternal or familial bond that they, these two share, let's question the motivation here. To a small extent, there probably is some deep connection between Wolfsheim and Gatsby that is paternal and genuine. But he sees something in Gatsby that he likes. He says, Gatsby's a smart man. He works hard. What does Wolfsheim say? Oh, Gatsby was an Augsburg man. His Jewish New York accent, he can't say Oxford, so he's Augsburg. Wolfsheim uses Gatsby. He sees Gatsby as someone who can make him a lot of money. A good, clean person, so it seems, who has that genuine smile, and he's smart, and he makes a lot of money off Gatsby. And I think this is the undertone of everything Wolfsheim does. Um, and so I think the relationship between Wolfsheim and Gatsby is really overshadowed by that selfishness that both of them um, demonstrate. Gatsby benefits from it too, though. So if, we, if Gatsby made money, I wonder what Wolfsheim is like. All right, let's continue on because we do meet a fascinating character. Wolfsheim doesn't know anything about Gatsby's family. But Nick does receive a telegram from somebody, and he receives him from, the telegram is from a man named Henry C. Gatz. So yes, this is actually Gatsby's father. Um, so far, we've only known Gatsby in isolation, as Gatsby's presented himself. The only perspective Nick had on Gatsby is what Gatsby told, has told Nick up to this point. So now, a really fascinating thing happens with the novel is we get somebody who really truly knows Gatsby and tells that to Nick. So Nick, above anybody else, really has the most complete view of who Gatsby is as a character, as a person. So what happens, Henry C. Gatz, he arrives from Minnesota. Um, Gatsby's father found out about 
Gatsby's death because he read it in a Chicago newspaper. My, the question you should be asking is, why on earth would Gatsby's death be told in a Chicago newspaper? Who keeps calling him? Philadelphia, Chicago, right? Gatsby is notorious in other places. He's a bootlegger, he's a gangster. So they were, people in Chicago are interested in Gatsby and they report on his death. And this is how Henry C. Gatz, Gatsby's father, finds out about it. On page 167, this is where we get the introduction of Henry C. Gatz. And from the very beginning, we see this tenderness and this affection that Gatsby's father has for his son. Of course, we have to remember that Jay Gatsby is sort of this alter ego that Gatsby created for himself, his platonic conception, as he called it. <clears throat> and there's this tenderness. The first thing Henry asks about his son is, where have they got Jimmy? He calls him Jimmy, right? Where have they got Jimmy? This tender fatherly affection we have. So let's start reading for uh, on the bottom of page 167, that very last line, and we'll hop over to page 168. So, after a little while, Mr. Gatz opened the door and came out, his mouth ajar, his face flushed slightly, his eyes leaking isolated and unpunctual tears. Right, he's grieving, of course. He had reached an age where death no longer has the quality of ghastly surprise. And when he looked around him now for the first time and saw the height and splendor of the hall and the great rooms opening out from it into other rooms, his grief began to be mixed with an odd pride. I helped him to a bedroom upstairs while I took off his coat and vest, and I told him all arrangements had been deferred until he came. What is Gatz, uh, Henry Gatz's reaction to the death of his son? Of course, he's grieving, but in a different way than, let's say, Nick. Nick, young, reckless, just like Jordan Baker's reckless and Tom and Daisy are reckless, they don't think about death until it happens. And it comes as a shock and it comes as a surprise, a tragedy. Henry Gatz, we get this image of a tender old man. Death does not have surprise. It's a reality that people, that he faces, that he understands well. So it's, it's this grieving morning moment but then when he looks at what Gatsby's house is like and he sees the grandeur and the, the ballrooms the bedrooms there's a pride there remember he came from or he still presumably is a poor farmer in the midwest and his son was able to move to new york and build this so there's some pride that comes from that of course with this pride we get the sense that henry Gatz does not know how exactly his son made his money lest he not be proud of him. Better not to ask if you don't want the answer. He's simply proud that his son, from the superficial interpretation, achieved his goal, became very successful monetarily. And so we get a more full picture of what Gatsby is like. So let's keep reading. We're still on page 168. I didn't know what you'd want, Mr. Gatsby. Look at what Nick calls him, Mr. Gatsby. And what's Henry's response? Quick, Gats is my name. He is strong about his identity. And this is a, a juxtaposition between the cultures of East and West. In the East, New York, you can create your identity. You can be whoever you want and achieve your goal. You can do anything you want, see yourself, blah, 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 blah. But Henry Gatz is a poor farmer from the Midwest. He doesn't have the grandiose illusions that people in New York have. He's grounded in reality. So when Nick calls him Gatsby, he's quick to say, my name is Gatz. I know who I am. I have my identity. I am in reality. I have no illusions. So Nick continues, Mr. Gatz, I thought you might want to take the body west where he's from. He shook his head. Jimmy always liked it better down east. He rose up to his position in the east. Let's pause here. This is what the whole novel is culminating to. And it starts from the very beginning, east egg, west egg. But these are both in the east of New York. So now east and west are beginning to have a different connotation. East of New York, west as in farmland almost, right? The frontier gritty it's earthy jimmy always liked it in the east because the east the city the lights 
It's where dreams flourish. Dreams that become illusions. And that's what, of course, we've seen Gatsby was after. He was after an illusion. You can't achieve an illusion in the West. It's too grounded in the earth, grounded in reality. But in the East, in New York, it might be possible, or so they seem. <clears throat> and so Henry says he rose up to his position in the East. It's only in the East, in West Egg, where you can pretend to be something you're not. Uh, and that's, so, that's where Henry wants to leave his son. But let's keep going. He asks Nick, were you a friend of my boys, Mr... We were close friends. He had a big future before him, you know. He was only a young man, but he had a lot of brain power here. He touched his head impressively, and I nodded. If he'd have lived, he'd have been a great man. A man like James J. Hill. He'd, help, he'd have helped build up the country. Even the way Henry Scats speaks is different. He'd have been a great man, right? This is colloquial dialect almost. Um, this is where Gatsby's from. But this sentence is very striking for us because it's if he would have lived. Now, there are many ways we can interpret this. If he would have lived in the sense of if he had not been killed, he could have done something. He could have been a great man. But I think we can take this a little bit deeper. The question I want to pose is this. Is living your life in pursuit of an illusion or an unattainable dream truly living? What does it mean to be truly alive? If someone like Gatsby is just wholly consumed by illusions and not living in reality, essentially this is a life wasted, right? And this is what Gatsby realizes in the swimming pool before he dies. The illusions are shattered and he's reduced to nothingness, quite literally. So if he would have lived, we can also interpret as if he would have been grounded in reality, he could have been great. And this is the whole point of what Nick is trying to do. He's trying to remember or trying to make Gatsby as great as Gatsby wanted to be. The great Gatsby. Is it that Gatsby truly is great? My answer, no. Gatsby is not a great man. He lived a life of superficiality, of illusions, of hope, of an unattainable dream. Yet Nick is torn by the tension of wanting to believe in Gatsby, but also despising him for everything he stands for. It's almost an ironic title, The Great Gatsby. He's not great, but Nick wants him to be great. There's a, a moment in chapter eight or nine, I forget exactly where it is, I think it's in nine, when he goes back to Gatsby's house, I think for the last time in chapter nine, and he sees that some young children have graffitied Gatsby's house, right? In other words, defiled Gatsby. And so Nick goes and he scrubs off with his shoe the graffiti. It's almost like he's trying to preserve the integrity and dignity of what Gatsby could have been. He's trying to make Gatsby great, but he can't come to the realization of his failures. Or rather, he does, and he's just... You know, what happens when a dream is dissolved, when illusions are shattered? Um, so he could have been great. And so we see this overwhelming pride... Um, in Henry Gatsby because of his son, although we can assume that he doesn't have a full knowledge of Gatsby's endeavors. But I want to turn also to page 172. This is where we really get a lot more information uh, about Gatsby as a boy from, his, from, from a father's perspective. So what does this look like? <clears throat> All right, um, page 172, right after Wolfsheim's speech, uh, this is where Nick leaves Wolfsheim and he goes back and speaks with Henry Gatz. So, towards the top of the page. When I left Wolfsheim's office, the sky had turned dark and I got back to West Egg in a drizzle, this rain image again. After changing my clothes, I went next door and found Mr. Gatz walking up and down excitedly in the hall. His pride in his son and in his son's possessions was continually increasing and now he had something to show me. Look at what he's proud in, his son's possessions. Even a man like Henry Gatz takes pride in materialism. This is the standard of wealth and position and meaning in this society. What does he want to show? Well, Jimmy sent me this picture. He took out his wallet with trembling fingers. Look there. It was a photograph of the house. 
cracked in the corners and dirty with many hands. He pointed out every detail to me eagerly. Look there! And then he and then sought admiration for my eyes. He had shown it so often that I think it was more real to him now than the house itself. We see that even Henry Gatz has a romantic idealism about him. Gatsby sent his own father a picture of the house. And Gatsby's father could show this to people and say, look at what my son built. Look at what my son was able to accomplish. Almost like Gatsby did with Daisy, Henry Gatz built up his own son in a way that isn't real. The image of the picture, the dream or illusion, becomes more real than Gatsby himself. It's a lot easier to have pride in somebody who, when you don't know their faults. All right, keep going here. Jimmy sent it to me. I think it's a very pretty picture. It shows up well. Very well. Had you seen him lately? He came out to see me two years ago and bought me the house I live in now. Of course, he was broke up when he ran off from home, but I see now there was a reason for it. He knew he had a big future in front of him, and ever since he made a success, he was very generous with me. So we get an even more complete picture here. How did Gatsby get out? Why did he join the army? He ran away from home. We took a quiz where I asked you where Gatsby was from, and of course he's from North Dakota. A lot of you put Michigan because you remembered that Gatsby was on the shore of Lake Superior. Now we learn that Gatsby ran away from home as a boy in pursuit of his dream. Maybe he joined the military as a means of escape. Maybe he was drafted. Who knows? The point is he left home because he was pursuing his dream or his illusion, and you couldn't do that in the West. You had to go East. You had to go somewhere different to pursue this dream. But how does Henry Gatz know that Gatsby was destined for a big future? Page 173, we see this interesting schedule that Gatsby creates for himself as a boy, as a child. He was always obsessed with self-improvement, self-development, right? This strict schedule, rise from bed, 6 a.m., exercise, study electricity and other things, right? This is a person, Jay Gatz, James Gatz, who wanted, who had a goal and was going to do anything to pursue and achieve that goal. Study electricity, practice elocution, poise, and how to attain it for an hour every day. What is elocution? It's the art of speaking properly. Poise, right? Having, um, oh, the word escapes me, but you get it, right? And think of the way he speaks. Old sport, right? It's this almost fake, uh, he's trying to be something he's not. And he practiced this. He's created an artificial version of himself. The ideal of what he thinks he could be. Um, but also general resolves. No wasting time. No smoking. No uh, read improving books one a week. Be better to parents. Right? There's no vice in young Gatsby other than the pursuit of an unattainable dream. So with this information, knowing that even from his boyhood, he was obsessed with becoming better and pursuing this dream, I ask again. Why is he in love with Daisy? I can't admit that it's because of Daisy herself. But again, in Daisy was everything he wanted. The society, the wealth, the sophistication. And that's why Daisy, it was so easy for him to build her up into this image that was bigger than herself. And he was in love with the idea and the ambition and the goal and the dream he put into Daisy, not herself. So. I'm sorry for those who want to say who want to read this romantically and say that he had such a love for Daisy because at the end of the day, it's not about Daisy, but from the very beginning, it's about Gatsby achieving his own goal. Very Emersonian, don't you think? He could create his own truth. He could create his own reality. And the only thing that mattered is what he thought of himself. And the only thing that mattered is that he was self-reliant, independent, but what does that philosophy lead you to? Nothing but disappointment and destruction. And this is the emptiness, not only of the book and of the society, but of Fitzgerald himself, right? Again, this is very close to what Fitzgerald actually experienced in himself. He was from the Midwest, but I'm getting ahead of myself. That's for the next video. We'll talk about that later.
So let's move over to the funeral, page 174. <clears throat> All right, I'm only going to read a little bit more. Bottom of page 174. First, who attends this funeral? Very small. Um, servants do. I'm not going to count them. Those are Wolfsheim's men. They're servants. They have to be there. The ones who choose to be there. Nick, Gatsby's father, and Owl Eyes makes a cameo again, right? This guy that was fascinated with the books and just fascinated with things is the only one out of the thousands of people that attended Gatsby's party. He's the only one that shows up. So, bottom of page 174. I tried to think about Gatsby then for a moment, but he was already too far away, and I could only remember without resentment that Daisy hadn't sent a message or a flower. Daisy hadn't sent a flower. Look at the irony there. Dimly, I heard someone murmur, Blessed are the dead that the rain falls on. Of course, rain again. And then the owl-eyed man said, Amen to that, in a brave voice. We straggled down quickly through the rain to the cars. owl Eyes spoke to me by the gate. I couldn't get to the house, he remarked. Nick says neither could anybody else. Go on, he started. Why, my God, they used to go there by the hundreds. And isn't that the truth? They used to go to Gatsby's house by the hundreds when Gatsby could give them something. But now that Gatsby's no longer throwing his parties, they don't show up. He took off his glasses and wiped them again. Outside and in. The poor son of a bitch, he said. This is all he says about Gatsby. This is, in, it's so crude, but this is really what Gatsby's reduced to, this phrase. This is his epitaph. No one's going to remember Gatsby for his greatness, and this is what Nick's trying to do, trying to remember Gatsby as great. But in reality, no one's going to remember him for his parties, for his, well, maybe for his parties, but for his greatness. He didn't contribute anything. He was a bootlegger who pursued a false dream and failed. And this is all that can be said of Gatsby at his grave. It's so sad and tragic. But then this prompts Nick to a very interesting diversion in thought. And this is his memory coming back from college. Remember, he went to Yale. His memory of Christmas break coming back from college in December. So turn with me to page 175. Nick talks about how this is one of his most vivid memories going back west for college. So, huh. Yale is in uh, Connecticut, New Haven, Connecticut, <clears throat> and so many people travel back home for Christmas. You guys will experience this soon if you go out of state for college. What is the description he shows? He goes home, and the snow is falling. It's cold. You can see your breath. And he's starting to have a fond memory of this and the people that he would interact with. Bottom of page 175. When we pulled out into the winter night, and so again, this is Nick, Nick's memory from college. When we pulled out into the winter night and the real snow, our snow, began to stretch out beside us and twinkle against the windows and the dim lights of small Wisconsin stations moved by, a sharp wild brace came suddenly into the air. We drew in deep breaths of it as we walked back from dinner through the cold vestibules, unutter unutterably aware of our identity with this country for one strange hour, before we melted indistinguishably into it again. This is deep. In one sense, this is a story about identity, right? Who is Gatsby? Gatsby? What Gatsby? I heard he killed a man, the rumors. We learn that Gatsby is a man. One of his faults is that he thought he could create his reality. In other words, he thought he could create his own identity. He thought he could run away from home, detach himself from all reality, and make himself what he wanted. This is the dream and illusion of these people. Nick is discovering, however, that that is an impossible dream. And so now, after this, these events happen, after two years of reflecting on this, he realizes that he needs to go out back home, where his identity is rooted, rooted in the ground, right? And so he says here that 
In this moment where he's breathing the cold air of the West in the snow, he was aware of his identity with this country. What Fitzgerald is doing here is making a commentary on the American dream. What does it mean to be American, right? This is our course, American literature. Is it that we can pursue our dreams and achieve anything we want? Or is it in the case of Gatsby, we can create our own reality? And I think Fitzgerald is realizing writing this book that you cannot create reality. And this is something Fitzgerald himself tried to do. And so Nick decides to go back west. So let's keep reading on page 176. That's my Middle West. Not the wheat or the prairies or those lost sweet towns, right? He's not a farmer. Remember, Nick's family is wealthy. But the thrilling returning trains of my youth and the street lamps and sleigh bells in the frosty dark and the shadows of holly wreaths thrown by lighted windows on the snow. I am part of that. A little solemn with the feel of those long winters, a little complacent from growing up in the caraway house in a city where dwellings are still called through decades by a family's name. Right, Nick is seeing that his identity is very complex, and it's not something that you can just simply reject, like Gatsby did, but that you're, from where you're from helps to shape you. Your family helps to shape you. It's all a part of you. Now, it's important to know that he's not saying it determines who or what you are or it determines how you act. He's simply saying it's a part of you. You cannot simply create your own reality or your own identity as if it were from nothing. There has to be ground, it has to be grounded in truth and reality. This, these, this next sentence here. I see now that this has been a story of the West after all. Who's he talking to? In one sense himself, in one sense, it seems like he's talking directly to the reader. I see now that this has been a story of the West after all. Tom and Gatsby, Daisy and Jordan and I were all Westerners, and perhaps we possessed some deficiency in common which made us subtly unadaptable to Eastern life. I don't think he's necessarily saying like, oh, West and East can't mix. And also, excuse me one second, I have to charge my laptop. He's not saying that Westerners and Easterners can't mix. I think he's diving deep and using the symbolism of East and West. East is where you can convince yourself of your own reality, but West is where you're grounded. And I think that's what they couldn't get out of them, no matter how hard they tried. They couldn't escape their realities. Now, I want to dive deep into this next paragraph here. Nick continues on. Even when the East excited me most, even when I was most keenly aware of its superiority to the bored, sprawling, swollen town beyond the Ohio, right here he's talking about the restlessness of the generation, with their in interminable inquisitions, sorry, interminable, yeah, inquisitions which spared only the children and the very old, even then it had always for me a quality of distortion. He's saying the East always had a quality of distortion. West Egg, especially, still figures in my more fantastic dreams. I see it as a nightly scene by El Greco. Hundred houses, at once conventional and grotesque, crouching under a sullen overhanging sky and a lusterless moon. The image he's giving here is that the, e the East, including West Egg, is a distorted reality. All right, and he likens it to a painting by El Greco. Now, I know you are... are all art aficionados, but I'm going to give you an image of El Greco's paintings nonetheless, and I believe this is the painting that Nick has in mind. El Greco is known for painting very, oops, sorry about that, I'm trying to zoom in just a little bit for you. Perhaps not. El Greco is known for painting very distorted images, very elongated, unrealistic like human beings, very haunting of a style, but also very beautiful, and this is how he remembers West Egg, like this painting, at once unrealistic, grotesque, haunting, but at the same time with an appeal, right? A representation of the scorn and fascination which Gatsby gives Nick. All of this to say, Nick is recognizing he needs to go back to reality and he's going to find that 
home by going back west. This is a story of the west. Okay, last point before I promise this video will stop. How does he break off with Nick, uh, with Jordan as well as Daisy and Tom? So, page 177, he breaks up with Jordan definitively. Let's go ahead and read. Middle of the page. You did throw me over, said Jordan suddenly. You threw me over on the telephone. I don't give a damn about you now, but it was a new experience for me, and I felt a little dizzy for a while. All right, so Jordan is referring to a previous scene where she tried calling Nick and Nick didn't want to talk to her after all these events. Remember, Nick associates Jordan with all these people and just wants to be rid of all of them. We shook hands. Oh, and do you remember, Jordan added, a conversation we had once about driving a car? Do you guys remember talking about that at the party? Nick and Jordan were talking about it. Why, not exactly. Jordan says, you said a bad driver was only safe until she met another bad driver. Well, I met another bad driver, didn't I? I mean, it was careless of me to make such a wrong guess. I thought you were rather an honest, straightforward person. I thought it was your secret pride. Pause here. Let's think back again to this moment where Jordan and Nick were talking. And Nick says, you're a reckless person. You're a bad driver. She says, yeah, so. I'm fine as long as I don't meet another bad driver, right? We know that Jordan's a liar, she's ambitious, she's vicious, she doesn't have virtue. And Nick prides himself, if you recall, on being honest, right? I'm one of the few honest people I've ever met. At the same time, he says, at opening line, I reserve moral judgments. My father taught me to never judge anybody. We've seen him quite hypocritical throughout the novel with both of these. We've questioned his honesty, and we've seen him make moral judgments. And here, he finally admits to it, right? Nick says, I'm 30. I'm five years old to lie to myself and call it honor. Nick has matured to a point where he can admit that he can no longer lie to himself, and he can recognize that he's lied in the past. This is something Jordan has not recognized, right? She lies to win golf games. She blows people off, she hides her feelings, and she thinks it makes her stronger, more important, I don't know. Nick is done with all this. He can't live that life. He's not gonna pretend to be superior because he doesn't make judgments, he knows he does. He's not gonna pretend that he tells the truth, he knows he lies. So what we see is this development in Nick. Finish off 177. She didn't answer, angry and half in love with her, and tremendously sorry, I turned away. Nick admits he's still in love with Jordan Baker. Why does she, he let her go? Not because of, again, as we've talked about, his questions of sexual orientation or anything like that, but because he recognized that he can't live in this world anymore, and Jordan is as much a part of this world as Tom, Daisy, and Gatsby. He's longing for truth now. He's longing for reality. He's not gonna live in any false delusions anymore. And sorrowfully, he turns away from Jordan. And of course we have to top it off. He actually encounters Tom Buchanan once more by chance. Runs into him in town. Now we know we, without saying, it goes without saying, Nick has very harsh feelings towards Tom, right? Not only did Tom let George Wilson believe that Gatsby was the one who killed Myrtle. <clears throat> but all of this, there's so much tension with Tom. We don't, we've, we've talked about it. So Tom and Daisy are East Eggers. We know this. They're, much, they're as much people of the East as anybody else. Wealth, and they just hide into their security. And really, Nick gives a scathing analysis of Tom and Daisy that's just spot on. Page 179. They were careless people, Tom and Daisy. They smashed up things and creatures and then retreated back into their money or their vast carelessness or whatever it was that kept them together and let other people clean up the mess they had made. The failure of Tom and Daisy throughout this novel is a on a few levels. One, the superficiality, the materialism, all these things we can talk about. They're reckless, just like Jordan's reckless, just like Gatsby's reckless but the selfishness drives them to believe that their actions don't affect other people. 
And the death of Myrtle changes all this. Nick sees that you can't live your life based on your own truth or reality because it's gonna end in destruction of not only your life, but in other people's lives. Now, Tom and Daisy can get away with it, according to Nick, because of their immense wealth. They retreat into their money and they pretend like nothing happens. They can leave the country, go on trips, and just cover everything up. They live in their own illusion. Nick is rejecting all of that. And this is why he goes out west. And for here, I'm going to leave the last pages, the last page really of Gatsby for the next video when we conclude the whole thing. We're almost done with this. I hope we've had some great conversations and ideas and next class, next video, we're gonna do a summary of the whole book and that will pretty much end our investigation through Gatsby. So I hope you've enjoyed it so far.